Well, these murder and jury statistics remind me of a certain very extraordinary trial and execution of 20 years ago. This is a scrap of history familiar to all old Californians and worthy to be known by other peoples of the earth that love simple, straightforward justice unencumbered with nonsense. I would apologize for this digression, but for the fact that the information I'm about to offer is apology enough in itself. And since I digress constantly anyhow, perhaps it's well to eschew apologies altogether and thus prevent their growing irksome. Captain Ned Blakely, that name will answer as well as any other fictitious one, for he was still with the living at last accounts and may not desire to be famous, sailed ships out of the harbor of San Francisco for many years. He was a stalwart, warm-hearted, eagle-eyed veteran who had been a sailor for nearly fifty years, a sailor from early boyhood. He was a rough, honest creature, full of pluck, and just as full of hard-headed simplicity, too. He hated trifling conventionalities. Business was the word for him. He had all a sailor's vindictiveness against quips and quirks of the law, and steadfastly believed that the first and last aim and object of the law and lawyers was to defeat justice. He sailed for the Chinch Islands in command of a guano ship. He had a fine crew, but his negro mate was his pet, and on him he had for years lavished his admiration and esteem. It was Captain Ned's first voyage to the Chinches, but his fame had gone before him, a fame of being a man who would fight at the dropping of a handkerchief when imposed upon, and would stand no nonsense. It was a fame well earned. Arrived in the islands, he found that the stable of conversation was the exploits of Bill Noakes, a bully, the mate of a trading ship. This man had created a small reign of terror there. At nine o'clock at night, Captain Ned alone was pacing his deck in the starlight. A form ascended the side and approached him. Captain Ned said, Who goes there? I'm Bill Noakes, the best man in the islands. What do you want aboard this ship? I've heard of Captain Ned Blakely, and one of us is better man than the other and I'll know which before I go ashore. You've come to the right shop, I'm your man. I'll learn you to come aboard this ship without an invite. He seized Noakes, backed him against the mainmast, pounded his face to a pulp and threw him overboard. Noakes was not convinced. He returned the next night, got the pulp renewed and went overboard head first as before. He was satisfied. A week after this, while Noakes was carousing with his sailor crowd on shore at noonday, Captain Ned's colored mate come along, and Noakes tried to pick a quarrel with him. The Negro evaded the trap and tried to get away. Noakes followed him up. The Negro began to run. Noakes fired on him with a revolver and killed him. Half a dozen sea captains witnessed the whole affair. Noakes retreated to the small after cabin of his ship with two other bullies and gave out that death would be a portion of any man that intruded there. There was no attempt made to follow the villains. There was no disposition to do it and indeed very little thought of such an enterprise. There were no courts and no officers. There was no government. The islands belonged to Peru and Peru was far away. She had no official representative on the ground and neither had any other nation. However, Captain Ned was not perplexing his head about such things. It concerned him not. He was boiling with rage and furious for justice. At nine o'clock at night, he loaded a double-barreled gun with slugs, fished out a pair of handcuffs, and got a ship's lantern, and summoned his quartermaster and went ashore. He said, You see that ship there at dock? Aye, sir. That's the Venus. Aye, sir. You, you know me? Aye, sir, very well, then. Take the lantern. Carry it just under your chin. I'll walk behind you and rest this gun barrel on your shoulder, pointing forward. So, keep your lantern well up so as I can see things ahead of you. I'm going to march in on Noakes and take him and jug the other chaps. 
If you flinch, well, you know me. Aye, sir. In this order, they filed aboard softly, arrived at Noak's den. The quartermaster pushed the door open, and the lantern revealed three desperados sitting on the floor. Captain Ned said, I'm Ned Blakely. I've got you under fire. Don't you move without orders, any of you. You two kneel down in the corner, faces to the wall. Now, Noakes, put these handcuffs on. Now come up close. Quartermaster, fasten them. All right. Don't stir, sir. Quartermaster, put the keys on the outside of the door. Now, man, I'm going to lock you two in. And if you try to burst through this door, well, you've heard of me. Bill Noakes, fall in ahead and march. All set. Quartermaster, lock the door. Noakes spent the night on, on board Blakely's ship, a prisoner under strict guard. Early in the morning, Captain Ned called in all the sea captains in the harbor, invited them with nautical ceremony to be present on board his ship at nine o'clock to witness the hanging of Noakes at the yard arm. What? The man has not been tried. Of course he hasn't. Didn't he kill the nigger? Certainly he did. But you're not thinking of hanging him without a trial. Trial? What do I need to try him for if he killed the nigger? Oh, Captain Ned, this will never do. Think how it will sound. Sound be hanged. Didn't he kill the nigger? Certainly. Certainly, Captain Ned. Nobody denies that. Then I'm going to hang him, that's all. Everybody I've talked to talks just the same as you do. Everybody says he killed the nigger. Everybody knows he killed the nigger and had every lever of you wants him to tried for it. I don't understand such bloody foolishness as that. Tried. Mind you, I don't object to trying him if it's going to be done to give satisfaction and I'll be there and chip in and help too. But put it off till afternoon. Put it off till afternoon for I've got my hands middle and full till after the burying. Why, what do you mean? Are you going to hang him anyhow and try him afterwards? Didn't I say I was going to hang him? I never saw such people as you. What's the difference? You ask a favor and then you ain't satisfied when you get it? Before or after is all one. You know how the trial will go. He killed the nigger. Say, I must be going. If your mate would like to come to the hanging, fetch him along. I like him. There was a stir in the camp. The captains came in a body and pleaded with Captain Ned not to do this rash thing. They promised they would create a court composed of captains of the best character, and they impaneled a jury. They would conduct everything in a way becoming the serious nature of the business in hand and give the case an impartial hearing and the accused a fair trial. And they said it would be murder and punishable by the American courts if he persisted and hung the accused on his ship. They pleaded hard. Captain Ned said, Gentlemen, I'm not stubborn and I'm not unreasonable. I'm always willing to do just as near right as I can. How long will it take? Probably only a little while. Can I take him up the shore and hang him as soon as you're done? If he's proven guilty, he shall be hanged without unnecessary delay. If he's proven guilty, great Neptune, ain't he guilty? This beats my time. Why, you all know he's guilty, but at last they satisfied him that they were projecting nothing underhanded. Then he said, well, all right, you go on and try him. I'll go down and overhaul his conscience and prepare him to go like enough he needs it and don't want to send him off without a show for hereafter. This was another obstacle. They finally convinced him that it was necessary to have the accused in court. Then they said they would send a guard to bring him in. No, sir, I prefer to fetch him myself. He don't get out of my hands. Besides, I got to go to the ship and get a rope anyway. The court assembled with due ceremony and paneled a jury, and presently Captain Ned entered, leading the prisoner with one hand and carrying a Bible and a rope in the other. He seated himself by the side of his captive and told the court to up anchor and make sail. Then he turned a searching eye on the jury and detected Noakes' friends, the two bullies. He strode over and said to them confidentially, You're here to interfere, you see. 
Now you vote right, do you hear? Or else there'll be a double-barreled inquest here when this trial's off and your remainders will go home in a couple of baskets. The caution was not without fruit. The jury was a unit. The verdict, guilty. Captain Ned sprung to his feet and said, Come along, you're my meat now, my lad anyway. Gentlemen, you've done yourselves proud. I invite you all to come and see that I do it all straight. Follow me to the canyon a mile above here. The court informed him that a sheriff had been appointed to do the hanging, and Captain Ned's patience was at an end. His wrath was boundless. The subject of a sheriff was judiciously dropped. When the crowd arrived at the canyon, Captain Ned climbed a tree, arranged the halter, and came down and noosed his man. He opened his Bible and laid aside his hat, selecting a chapter at random. He read it through in a deep bass voice and with sincere solemnity he said lad you are about to go aloft and give account for yourself and the lighter a man's manifest is as far as sin's concerned the better for him make a clean breast man and carry a log with you that'll bear inspection you killed the nigger no reply a long pause the captain read another chapter pausing from time to time to impress the effect then he talked an earnest, persuasive sermon to him and ended by repeating the question, Did you kill the nigger? No reply other than a malignant scowl. Then the captain now read the first and second chapters of Genesis with deep feeling, paused a moment, closed the book reverently, and said with a perceptible savor of satisfaction, There, four chapters. There's few that would take pains with you that I have. Then he swung up the condemned and made the rope fast, stood by and timed him half an hour with his watch, then delivered the body to the court. A little after, as he stood contemplating the motionless figure, a doubt came into his face. Evidently, he felt a twinge of conscience, a misgiving, he said with a sigh. Well, perhaps I'd have burnt him, maybe, but I was trying to do for the best. When the history of this affair reached California, it was in the early days. It made a deal of talk, but did not diminish the captain's popularity to any degree. It increased it, indeed. California had a population then that inflicted justice after a fashion that was simplicity and primitiveness itself, and could therefore admire appreciatively when the same fashion was followed elsewhere.